Hi and welcome to Programming Percy. Today we will be talking about one topic that is really cool and really useful once you get to know it and that's domain driven design, uh, specifically domain driven design in Go and how to implement it uh, efficiently. I released an article about this uh, about a year ago and that's one of my most loved articles so I'm super thrilled to be making this video right now and uh, let's get going. So microservices has become this very popular approach to build software in the recent years. Now microservices are used because they're scalable and flexible software. Uh, it's very easy building a small piece of software that runs and performs one single task and make that really good compared to making this huge monolith. And it also allows you to replace these small pieces very easily. So it's very favorable once you start using it. In this article, we will be building a tavern, an online tavern. And while we are building the tavern, we will explore certain parts of domain driven design and hopefully it will make it a little bit easier to understand domain driven design when we implement it one single piece at a time because whenever I myself started reading about domain driven design my head kind of exploded uh, there were so many terms so many things to learn and I just was overwhelmed and if you don't know um, why my head exploded when I started reading about domain driven design. Let's have a look at uh, Eric Evans, who is the inventor of domain driven design. His book contains a graph of all the items in domain driven design. As you can see here, there's a bunch of terms to learn and everything's connected to each other. And it's kind of hard to wrap your head around the first time. And there's a reason why Eric Evans needed a book on 500 pages to explain everything. So first off I'd like to point out that this article describes my interpretation of domain driven design and how to best implement it in Go and it's based on my experience working with Go for many many years and how I've noticed that what works best for me and my team. In this video I will be naming the folders inside the project cor uh, corresponding to the domain driven design term. So if we have something called entities, for example, they will be in a package called entities. This is not something I recommend you to do in a production repository, in a real repository. This is just to showcase and make it easier to understand what's what. I have a second video, an article where we restructure a little bit. So in this video we will learn the terms, we will learn to implement it and in the second video we will um, structure it a little bit, making it a little bit more clean. Um, I see many heated discussions on uh, the internet about DDD. Um, many people are discussing how to implement it. It's a uh, it's open for interpretation so many people are doing it in different ways. Um, one thing that I kind of get sad about is that people are often discussing small typical terms like this term means this and this and I think it's not important. I think the important part is to follow the methodology that Eric is trying to make a point about and DDD is a huge area we will look at how to implement it but before we do that I'm gonna make a small recap about what domain driven design is. So domain driven design is a way of structuring and modeling our software after the domain where it belongs to. What this means is that a domain first has to be considered before the software is written. Uh, and the domain is the topic that the problem or software intends to be working on. So uh, DDD 
kind of advocates that the engineering team should meet up with the subject matter experts, the SMEs, uh, who are experts within the domain, so that the subject matter experts can share their knowledge with the engineers. So for instance, if I were to build a stock trading platform, uh, would I as an engineer know best how to build one? Well, programmatically, I would be the right person, but I wouldn't have any trading knowledge. I would build a much better platform if I had a few sessions with Warren Buffett, who could explain the domain to me. And the architecture in the code should reflect this domain. So we will see this whenever we are writing our own tavern. So let's go ahead and make a quick story. A story is used, the story is used to better make us understand the topic at hand. So, this is the story about Dante, a gopher who wants to build an online tavern. Dante knows how to write code, but he doesn't know anything about running a tavern, which is problematic. So, one day when he's out work, walking, he meets a guy in a top hat, and the top hat approaches him, saying, Do you need help with your tavern? Dante is thrilled. They have a talk where they discuss how to run a tavern. Dante asks questions such as how do we handle regular drinkers? And the top hat kind of nicely replies, well, let's call them customers, not drinkers. And he goes on explaining how a tavern operates. We need customers, we need employees, we need banking, we need suppliers. So why are we talking about Dante in the top hat? Well, we're talking about them because we can use them to explain what's going on in domain-driven design terms. So what has happened here is Dante and the top hat had a meeting. They had something called a domain modeling session. It's a session where the subject matter expert, the top hat, explains to Dante, the engineer, about the domain. He explains things that are needed for a tavern. And this is done to learn something that we call the model. And the model is an abstraction of the needed components to handle the domain. The banking, the customers, the, ta uh, the billing, for instance. In domain-driven design, we often talk about the root or the core domain. In our case, the core domain will be the tavern. And we have something called customers, which will be a subdomain. And the top hat also points us to us that we don't call the customers drinkers. And what has happened here is we have something called ubiquitous language. Now, basically it's the basically it's about talking the same language between the experts and the engineers. I've been to many firms in my life and I've seen many places where different departments are naming the same thing differently and they're referring to it in a different way, which sometimes becomes problematic. Now we need to find a unified language with which everyone in the team or involved understands. That is called, that's called the ubiquitous language. So. I think that covers very quickly about domain-driven design. You have the domain, you have basically the topic, the core topic, and then that's divided into subtopics or subdomains. So um, I think basically we are ready to start coding. So one of the first, first things that we will begin coding is entities and value objects. Now entities are uniquely identifiable items or structures and they are mutable. So we have, for instance, a gopher or a person which is uniquely identified by their social security number. For instance. But we can also modify them. They can change and they can put on a top hat. Value objects are non-identifiable items which are immutable. We cannot change them. So let's go ahead and start implementing a little bit uh, inside of our code. So let's go ahead and start implementing the entities and the value objects and learn a little bit more about them. So 
it's time to start building the tavern. Let's begin by making a new folder which I've created and let's start by initializing a go module. So go mod init, in my case I will do github.com first the polymer ddd go. So once that's created we will begin by creating a domain folder. The domain folder will be storing all the subdomains that we need but let's begin by the, with the domain. So we're creating the domain folder. So before we can implement the domain we also need the entity. So let's create a second folder called entity. And as I said the entities are structures that are has a identifier, a unique identifier, and that can change state. And by changing state we mean that the values can update. They're mutable. We will begin by creating two entities, persons and items. And I like keeping my entities separate from my domains because that allows us to reuse the entities in different domains. So let's go ahead and create two files in the entities. We have item.go and we have person.go. <clears throat> so inside person we will begin by creating the person package. So uh, let's or the entities package. So this holds all the entities that are shared across subdomains and let's call it entity and we're going to do a new structure which is person and a person is an entity that represents a person in all domains so Let's go ahead and create a um, unique identifier for the persons. So the ID is the identifier of the entity. So I'm going to go ahead and use the Google UUID, uh, which is a package which is really nice for... Um, it selected the wrong one, so let's change that to Google. Uh, it's really nice to create unique identifiers, I do recommend it. So let's import that and do go mod tidy. It will fetch it for us. And let's go ahead. So a person can also have a name. So let's add a name. And we can have the age as an integer. So this is our person entity. It's something that we can represent as an entity. So let's go ahead and do the same thing for uh, the items. So I'm just gonna go ahead and copy whatever we have. I'm gonna change this to item. It's an, um, an item, and an item has a unique identifier because it's an ent ident because it's an entity. We do have to have an identifier. We have a name of the item, and maybe we have a description instead of an age, which is also a string. So great, we have defined. Two entities and it's as simple as that. We have uniquely identifiable and we are having the fields as uh, capital letters which in Go means that we can access them from outside of the package and we can modify it. There can be occurrences where we have structures that are immutable and does not have unique identifiers. And they, these structures are called value objects as we said before. So let's go ahead and create a new folder, folder called value object and let's create a file called transaction. So a transaction is something that's immutable, we cannot change it. The transaction has been performed, um, it's there, we cannot do anything about it once it's done. In a real world application a transaction would of course have an ID connected to it but it's not mutable and that's the uh, kicker here. So let's create the package called value object and let's create the transaction structure and 
transaction is a value object because it has no identifier and is unmutable. So let's go ahead and this time I'm going to use lowercase values so no, no other domain will reach in and change the values. So let's go ahead, let's use UUID again from Google. So we will store the account from or the person from and we'll store the person ID who we transfer the money to which is great in a transaction to know where from and to and let's also have created at which is the time uh, when the transaction occurred. So we have entities, we have value objects. I hope that makes sense. The next thing to look at is the aggregate component. We cannot explain every real life thing with entities and value objects. Sometimes you need to combine them. That's what an aggregate is. So an aggregate is a combination of entities and value objects. When you combine them, you get an aggregate. So in my example, we will have a customer, for instance, and the customer uh, has a something called a root identity. Now the root identity is used to identify the aggregate. This is why the entity has to have a uniquely identifiable uh, identifier. So whenever we create a customer, we can say that the, the, a customer is a person and they are identifiable by the person ID. So the root entity, you can have multiple entities, we can have products, which is, uh, um, which is items in an array, but we don't connect the product ID to the customer ID. That wouldn't make any sense. So it's not the root entity, it's a sub entity. And a customer can also have transactions. So it's really important that you maintain only having one root entity. So you can identify the aggregate based on that. And a reason for aggregates is that the business logic for say customers should be inside the aggregate, not inside the entity. Entities are dumb, they're just placeholders for information. Now the aggregate can contain business logic. Um, so let's go ahead and do the same thing again. Let's open a new folder and let's call it aggregate. And inside aggregate, we'll create our first aggregate, which is a customer. And in here, we have the customer. So the package aggregate holds our aggregates that combines many entities into a full object. Let's say a full object. Package aggregate like that. So let's begin by creating the customer struct. And the customer struct is an aggregate, so it combines the entities. I know I'm repeating myself, but it's to make you understand this. So person is the root entity of the customer, which means that person.id is the main identifier for the customer. So let's make entity.person and we can also hold uh, products. So a person can buy many products and a customer can also perform transactions. So let's add transaction. <clears throat> now, you might notice that I set all the fields to lowercase, which means they're not accessible from other domain, from, from outside. I made this decision after talking a little bit to Milo Smolka at 3.labs. We had a discussion about this and aggregates should not be accessible directly to grab the data. Uh, the data is not accessible from outside. 
so they're going to be lowercase and also notice how I'm not using any JSON tags or anything and uh, we will cover that later but it's not up to the aggregate to decide how the data is supposed to be formatted we will look into this uh, soon also we set all the entities to pointers because they can change state and we want this to reflect across the whole runtime when everything something changes uh, so if we have a person in multiple places the change should reflect here um, and of course the transaction is not a pointer because it cannot change there's no reason to have it as a pointer so great we have a aggregate in place so up until this point we have only created entities value objects and aggregates we've only created a bunch of structs um, well it's time to start implementing some actual business logic and we will be starting with something called factories now the factory pattern is a design pattern that is used to encapsulate complex logic inside functions for creating the wanted instances without the a caller knowing anything about the actual implementation details uh, so factory pattern is very common you see it even outside domain driven design it's used widely so I want to show you a great example of the factory uh, pattern and one example is the elastic search package uh, um, on uh, for go and if you can see here, this is a factory for creating a new client. So they have a new client function, which accepts a configuration and returns a pointer to a client. So if you see what's going on here, uh, they are calling the new transport function. So if we go there, you can see there's a lot happening in here, which we don't want the developers who are using the library to really know anything about. They don't have the domain knowledge for what needs to be done when creating a client. They shouldn't have to. The factory should handle that for us. And that's what's happening here. So whenever we create a new Elasticsearch client, a bunch of code is being executed and fixing everything for us. We don't have to care. So domain-driven design suggests factories for creating complex aggregates, repositories or services, which we will look into soon. So let's go ahead and create a factory function for customers. Now customer is still a very simple class, but uh, we should really suggest, we should re really just try to make it as easy as possible. So we have a new customer and when we create a new customer, we will accept the name. We will return a customer and an error. So something can go wrong when we create new customers and we want to handle that for the users. So new customer is a factory to create a new customer aggregate. It will validate that the name is not empty, for instance. Uh, so if name equals empty, we will return customer and let's always return an exported uh, custom error which makes testing a lot easier so let's return error error invalid person and let's go ahead and go to the top and create that uh, error so it will be error invalid person equals a new error uh, a customer has to have a valid name for instance so we have a valid name let's create a person entity because we need that we need a root entity so we will assign the name we have the name let's assign that we will generate a new uuid by using the new function let's import the library so now that we have the person entity we can return the customer we can assign the person as the root entity we can generate an empty array of items or products and we can also generate an empty array of transactions uh, just to make sure that just to make sure that we we don't hit the um, 
users of our aggregate with nil pointer exceptions, for instance. Now everything is initialized, the arrays are initialized, they won't get nil pointer exceptions whenever they try to reach the products. Um, the factory has handled that for us. So this is a simple factory, um, really not much to it, just a helper basically to generate your structure. Um, and as always, uh, whenever we have whenever we have business logic like this in place, we should always test it. And I'm just gonna go ahead and create a aggregate test package real quick. Um, just to test our uh, factory. So let's go ahead and call it test customer, new customer. We are importing the testing library and let's build a test case. And the test case will have a name and we will have an input name to the, to the factory. X we will have an expected error returned from the function. And let's create some test cases. So I'm doing some table driven tests here. Uh, so let's create a test case. So one test case is of course, when we have the empty name, we want to know that the error is returned. Empty name validation. Uh, we have the name and we expect an error, which is aggregate because as you see here, we can reach the error since we export that because it's important. Whenever we return an error that is custom, we have to allow it to be exported so that the users of the package can validate and check that or what's going on. So that's one test case. The second test case is of course a valid name. Let's always test the happy path as well. So let's add a customer with Percy Balmer as name and we expect nil to be returned. We don't expect an error to be returned. Um, so let's go ahead and also loop through those test cases. So range test cases, we will run the test. We will assign the test name and we will let's see the test was test not name so we will run each test case we will execute a unit test for each one and we'll do aggregate new customer and let's pick the name that we set and we will check that the errors is error and the expected error. So if the error isn't the same as we expected, we of course want to return an error. Expected error, um, but we got, let's do that in case it's nil. Um, so the V, the V here stands for like interface. Uh, so even if the error is nil, we won't get a nil pointer exception. So we have a test. We can run the test to make sure that we are getting the correct input output. And we are, as you see here, we ran the test cases and they succeeded, which is great. We know that our factory is working. So I hope the factory makes sense. The factory starts a little bit on the business logic. It creates our instances and helps us with uh, whatever uh, has to be performed. Um, whenever I come from another domain and has have to create a customer, I don't have to care about what happens when I create a customer. I have to care about the input values and uh, basically the output error. That's what I need to care about. We can create a bunch of stuff. That's what we have right now. We have entities, we have the aggregate, which combines them into um, being uh, a customer. But before we talk a little bit about the customer not having any data tags, no JSON tag, no BSON tag, no CSV. And this is because aggregates are stored by repositories. 
So an aggregate is a combination of entities or value objects. But when we store them or when we manage them, we're using a repository. So the repository is used to store and manage aggregates. Repository pattern is, again, it's a pattern which you not only will find in domain-driven design, it's a pattern widely used in many, many, many uh, other paradigms. Now, it's one of the patterns that I love the most. I love repository pattern. Once you learn it, you will probably use it all the time, or at least it was like that for me. Now, the pattern relies on hiding the implementation details behind a interface. And this is allows, what, uh, what repository pattern allows us to do is allows us to build very modular and changeable, day, um, changeable uh, software. So basically we can have a in-memory repository which stores customers in memory whenever we do unit tests, but then we can also have a MySQL uh, repository. And whenever the managers comes and say, hey, we're changing from MySQL to MongoDB, for instance, we can build a new repository for MongoDB and fulfill the same interface as the MySQL repository. And then we can just swap it and everything should work ex as expected. You don't have to re-modify, refactor a lot of code. You simply refactor a repository and then it should propagate to the all other domains and just work. So inside domains, let's create a new folder called customer. Now, customer will hold our repository for customers. And we will begin by creating a file called repository.go. And it's inside the customer package. And we will add a few errors which are exported to the users. So we have Whenever a customer is not found, for instance, we will export that error. The customer was not found in the repository. Repository. Let's import errors so we don't get any warnings. Let's create error fail to add customer. And let's have update customer, maybe whenever they try to update the customer, we will return an error. And we'll create a interface. Now the interface is the repository. So let's go ahead. I'm gonna be naming it customer repository. Um, you should find a nice naming convention, which is explanatory. I'm not totally fond of having repository inside the name, but it works. So we need to define a few functions that are required to be part of a repository for customers. And we want to be able to fetch customers, so let's have a git. And we know that the unique identifier is a Google UUID, so let's accept that as input. And let's return the aggregate.customer. So whenever we have a structure that has this function, they will be considered a repository. So it doesn't matter if the customer is fetched from MongoDB, MySQL, in memory, whatever, it doesn't matter. As long as we can call the get function and get what we want, it's fine. Let's also be able to add customers. So let's from the aggregate customer return an error. Let's also be able to update so also return an error. So this is our repository for fetching customers and managing, managing them. So now we actually need to implement a solution. We have only created the interface which tells us how a repository should look. Let's go ahead and create a interface for it uh, that fulfills the interface. So I will be creating a new folder called memory which will hold our in-memory solution 
uh, for the repository, which we can use to kind of um, maintain and test things in the unit test and building a POC basically. So let's create a new file. I'm going to call it memory.go. So package, package memory is a in memory implementation of customer repository. I hope this makes sense. Uh, you will probably see very soon how it all aligns. So let's create a new type. Let's call it memory and let's call it memory repository to make everything super clear. Now the memory repository will hold a map with UUIDs as keys because we want to be able to easily fetch the customers and the values will be customers and we will also protect this with a sync mutex for now. Now again it goes to fetch the wrong UUID package so I'll fix that. So we have the type let's create a factory always a factory function. The factory function will turn a pointer to the memory repository because we want to be able to update the memory repository and the memory repository will hold a map of UUIDs and customers. So we can create um, a memory repository. Now we also need to be able to get, add and update. So let's add functions for that. Get and we accepted a UUID and we returned aggregate customers and an error. Let's return everything as empty values for now. We just want to fulfill the repository. And the add function accepts a customer. Let's return nil. And the final function is update. So let's have that. And again, we accept a customer. We return an error and we return nil. We just want to fulfill the interface. So before we move on, we need to know uh, how we can fetch the customers. Now we need to add a way to retrieve data from the aggregate. So for instance, we need to be able to retrieve the ID from the aggregate. So let's jump back to the aggregate customer and let's add some functions because they are not accessible as you see. So inside the reposit memory repository, we cannot in our get function, for instance, we cannot do um, memory repository customers dot and there's nothing. We can't do person dot ID because person is not accessible. So we need to fix that. So let's go ahead, let's go inside the customer. Let's go down, let's add some simple functions. So if we have a pointer to a customer, maybe we have a get ID, which returns the UUID. And from here, we can reach the person ID. So let's return the ID. And uh, maybe we can also set the ID. Just freestyling a little bit. Uh, so let's set the UUID. And if c.person is equal nil, we will kind of create a new person with the ID. And if c person ID is equals to the new ID. Maybe we should be able to update and set the name. And so let's add a getter and setter for those as well. So set name allows us to modify the name. Again, let's make sure that the person isn't nil. If it is, we will just simply create. You could return an error here. Like if there's no such person or ID, 
you know, uh, return an error. Uh, let's see, I did something wonky. So let's change the name. This is just an example, but I'm pretty sure you get uh, and understand that the data is not accessible from outside of the aggregate. Nothing outside of the aggregate can modify the data. This is done by exposing functions that allows others to do it. So if we should be able to modify the name, we expose a function which allows you to do that. You don't directly go and modify it. So let's, in the get name, let's just return the name. Um, so now that we are exposing data from the aggregate, we can continue on the memory repository. So let's go ahead and fix the functions to actually manage this. So inside the memory here, we can do if customer okay, we can go to the customers and we can check if the ID is present. If it isn't present, if it is present, we will return the customer, simple as that. So, let's see, right, we didn't name it, so I'm adding the name. So we, the get function is receiving an ID, we're checking the customer's map for that ID, and if it's present, we are returning the customer. And if we don't find the aggregate or the customer, we will return a custom error for not finding it. So let's go to the repository file and re let's return error not found. So the error is defined inside the domain of customers. The customer domain has a error for when it's not found and the repository is simply using that error to uh, tell you that there's no such uh, no such customer. So whenever we are adding a, a customer, let's go, sh go ahead and check that the customers, um, if it's nil, we want to create the map. Now the factory function Now the factory function should have protected us against a empty customer's map, but for uh, extra safety, I'm just gonna go ahead and make sure that the map is actually created uh, whenever we try to add a customer. And if it isn't, we will create the map. So we're um, locking the, we're locking the structure and we're unlocking it whenever we're done and adding it. So once that's done, let's make sure the customer isn't already in the repository, in the repo. So let's go ahead and check. So if memory repository customers, and then we are getting a customer as input. So let's name him uh, C. So if C dot get ID, so we know that uh, the customer should be stored with their ID in the map. So let's grab the ID, check if he's present inside of the map. And if he's, he isn't, let's simply return a error. And we can wrap this error. We can do the customer already exists, for instance. Let's wrap. Them. and let's add fail to add customer. So we are returning an error to the users that they failed to add because the customer already exists. Now, if he doesn't already exist, let's go to the customers, let's get the ID again, and let's say that it's, and let's allocate the map to that. And then let's go ahead and unlock and return nil. So the add function is pretty simple. We check if the map is initialized. If it isn't, we do it. We check if the customer already exists. And if he doesn't, we add him. So 
Let's go ahead and do the update, which is fairly similar to the adding. Now we're going to check if he is available. So let's check if get ID exists. So if the customer exists or if he doesn't exist, let's return an error. So customer does not exist. We can't update something that doesn't exist. Customer and the customer error that we will return is error update customer. And if the customer exists, let's just go ahead and in this simple example, we will just overwrite the current allocation. So let's unlock and return it. So we have made a really simple implementation of the customer repository. It's going to store the customers in memory, but that doesn't matter for now. And we can really start working with this now. So let's go ahead and for our memory repository, let's go ahead and just quickly make a few tests so we know that it's working as expected. So let's go ahead, function test memory, get customer for instance. Let's make a qu quick test for that. So we have a test case for uh, this and we're going to have a name. We're going to have an ID which we search for and we're going to have an expected error. And to test this, we will be creating a new repository and we will try to add a customer to that repository. So let's go ahead and say that we have a customer and it will be a aggregate new customer we will call him Percy. We will check that the error isn't nil. If it is, we will actually do a fail because this is the initialization of the test. So let's go ahead and add the customer to the repository. So we need to create the repository first, memory repository. I'm not going to use the factory function here. I'm just going to manually create it. And the ID will be the customer. So we're creating a new customer. We're creating a repository ID. We're assigning the map place of ID to customer. So let's go ahead and create some test cases. And it's going to be name, no customer by ID. So let's go ahead and force a UUID. So we will do must parse. And I have a UUID prepared. So I will just simply copy paste that. And don't and let's say the expected error will be customer not found. So whenever we're searching for a UUID that doesn't exist, we expect the repository to return a customer not found. And let's have customer by ID. The ID will be ID that we created before. Maybe I wasn't totally uh, clear what I did here. I did create a customer up here to know in advance a legit ID, so we can search for that user inside test case. So let's go ahead and simply loop over the test cases. And we'll do tRun name, we will execute a test function, and that test function will just simply use the repository and get the ID and if errors isn't what we expect it to be, we will simply print that. Expected error, boom. but we got 
let's see, expect the error, but we got that error. So real quick, we have a memory repository. It allows us to add aggregates and manage them. We can get them, add them and update them. And in our unit tests, we create a customer named Percy. We create a memory repository. We search for an ID that doesn't exist and we expect a error. And we search for an ID that does exist and we expect that to also work. So we can go ahead and run our tests and we should get a 200, everything's all fine. So we have a in-memory solution which allows us to manage customers, the customer aggregate. So we have a first repository in place. I hope it makes sense what a repository is. It's used to manage aggregates. Remember to keep your repository related to your domain and in our case, the customer repository only handle customer aggregates, not more. We don't want to start coupling things inside the repositories. We won't lose coupling. So one repository handles one aggregate. Remember that. But let's be honest, the real, in the real world, we won't be able to have a whole logical flow inside the tavern where we rely on one customer repository. So we have to start coupling some somewhere. For instance, if we have an order, we need to uh, get the customer, make a billing and stuff. And that brings us to the next point of domain driven design. So we have all these entities, we have aggregates and we have repositories to manage the aggregates. But it doesn't really look like an application yet, does it? That's why we need the next component, which is called services. Now, a service will tie together all the loosely coupled repositories into a business logic that fulfills the, the needs of the domain. So in our tavern, we might need an order service. An order service is responsible for shaming together the repositories that performs an order. So getting the customer with the customer repository, getting the product with a product repository, for instance, and then making the order, uh, making the billing. So you would have a billing service, for instance, uh, and the service kind of takes these loosely coupled pieces and couples them together. And we will be implementing an order service in our tavern so we can start making orders. So it's not an aggregate. So let's go ahead and create a new folder called services. And the services will hold a order.go, which is a order service. And let's call it package services. Now, whenever you have services, the factories tends to get larger and more complex because you accept multiple repositories as input, for instance. And one trick I've learned when I was reading John Calhoun's uh, book about web development was a sort of a service configuration generator pattern. And we will be using that here because it's really allowing you to create flexible modular services where you can replace the repositories really easily. So let's have a look at how we can do this. So whenever we have a order service, we're going to create something called a order configuration. The order configuration is an alias for a function signature which will accept the order service and return an error. So let's go ahead and create the order service so we actually know what's going on. So we have the order service and the order service will have a customer repository because whenever, whenever somebody makes an order, they are a customer. So we need to handle the customer aggregate so we need the customer repository in the service. So we have a order service 
which and we also have an alias for uh, this so this alias it's a little bit complex but let's let's make an example and you will probably see and hopefully understand inside the factory we're creating a factory function for our service and we will accept a variable amount of order configurations and a configuration is a function which takes in a pointer to the order service and returns an error the reason why we take in a pointer to the order service is because we want to modify the service based on the configuration so let's go ahead and return the order service as a pointer and also an error so we begin by creating the order service inside our factory function and it's a pointer to a order service now we will loop through all the configs and apply them so let's go ahead loop through range through the configs and in here for each configuration we will simply execute the configuration and insert the order service as input we will check if the error is not nil and return nil if uh, and return error if it is let's return the order service and a nil at the bottom so I don't know if this makes much sense yet, but hopefully we will soon see how we can leverage this to customize the order service really much. Now, for smaller services, this approach might seem overkill, but it's really cool when you start building and having a lot of configurations that are accepted. Uh, so I'm gonna go ahead and create a order configuration, which applies a customer repository to the service so inside here we're going to create a function called with customer repository and it applies a customer repository to the order service and let's call it with customer repository and it accepts a customer repository as input and it returns a function signature of order configuration so let's explain this we return a function that matches the order configuration alias and we need to return a function so we can chain this. So let's go ahead. It's, it looks like this. Uh, and it modifies the order service. The order service holds a repository inside the customers field. So we do order service dot customers is equal to the customer repository that we received as input and we return nil. Nothing goes wrong here. Uh, not much to do. We can create a second um function which would be with memory customer repository for instance and it accepts no input uh, a parameter but we don't need this can change we don't need to accept the same inputs because we return a order configuration function so we don't have to care about how many inputs we need and if we do the memory customer if we do the with memory customer repository, we will create a new memory repository and we will return the previous function with the customer repository as input, which will in turn return the function, which will allow us to say that this is a configuration. I hope that makes sense. Let's, let's take a look at why we would do this why would we go through doing all this well it's because we can now do 
Whenever we are creating a new order service, we can do new order service with memory customer repository, for instance. Now this code would return a order service with a memory repository applied. Now you have probably seen this before. Uh, and a, a good example with full features would be like with logging and maybe the log level would be debug. For instance, this is just examples, but you, you probably understand with um, maybe we want tracing and we have a configuration for that. Uh, so the, we would have something like Jaeger, which traces everything that's done in the order service. We could maybe implement that through a function like this, which would apply a tracing to the order service. Now, the reason why you want to do this is because whenever you in the future change from in memory to MySQL, and you have this whole software and the order service is used in a lot of places, you don't want to refactor everything. You would simply build your repository for MySQL or MongoDB or whatever, and then you replace the simple configuration here with with Mongo customer repository, for instance, and everything would just continue working as long as your repository is working as expected. So it becomes super scalable, super modular, and just really amazing. So I really hope that makes sense. It's a bit, it might seem a little bit overkill for smaller services, but uh, I've seen, I've had projects with like 10 or 12 repositories in one service. And this has really been helpful when you reach that, when you reach that stage, it's really super helpful to be able to replace certain parts of the business logic maybe for a unit test or an integration test uh, maybe you have a mail service but you don't want to send real emails you can replace the repository for the emails as an example so let's begin adding a few functions for business logic for the service so i'm gonna go ahead here and do a pointer to order service function and let's create order and order is going to accept the customer ID which is again a Google UUID and we will accept a array, a array of IDs which will be products which they order so whenever somebody makes an order they hand in a array of UUIDs and we will begin by fetch the customer. So the service has access to the customers through the customer repository. So let's do customer and error equals the order service customers dot get. And we pass in the customer ID. What will happen here is that the customer service will use whatever customer repository is applied. MySQL, MongoDB, memory, it doesn't matter. Whatever we have applied through a order configuration, it will use and it will call the get function for that repository. In our case, the memory repository will get whatever is inside the customer's map. Now, if we don't get anything here, we will return error and we will return nil here and what we will do here is we will simply print line the customer now whenever somebody makes an order you would probably want to get each product and we need a product repository we have no product repository so we need to create one And then after we created the product repository, let's create a order configuration, which applies the product repository to the service. So the product repository uh, will go here 
we are in the aggregate so we need to create a product aggregate first remember a product and a repository has a one-one relationship if we have an aggregate called product we need a repository to manage them so we need both pieces so let's go ahead and create a new aggregate called product and the product will be a we will need a entity a root entity because this is an aggregate so let's go ahead and entity dot items because a product will have a root entity and that root entity will be an item a product also contains a price and a product also contains a integer so this is our product aggregate now we need a few 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 functions to expose the information first off we need a factory and it will accept name description and the price it will return a product because we're creating a product so let's go ahead and see is the name empty is the description empty and return product and maybe return error missing value so let's also create that error saying missing important values is this should be very much more explanatory than what it is right now but we're not learning how to write errors here uh, so let's return a product and the product will contain an item seeing as that is the root entity and the root entity will have a unique identifier it will have a name and it will have a description now let's also return nil so we also need to assign the price and maybe the quantity which would default to zero so we have a factory for creating products and we also want to be able to fetch the data from the product so let's go ahead and do get id which returns the uuid So p item dot id which is the root id and let's go ahead and do get item maybe so we can extract the entity from the aggregate that's a plausible scenario so get item will return the item from the product and we can get price for instance I mean this is basically will change depending on what your aggregate holds what kind of data your aggregate hold and what you need to expose so we have the product aggregate in place we can reach data inside the product aggregate and we can create products let's go ahead and inside domain create a new domain which is product and the product will hold a repository and we will define the product repository here so we will have product repository and it's an interface of course so the product repository will manage and handle the product aggregate now let's see we might need get all get all will return an aggregate a slice of products and we need get by id maybe so we can fetch certain products and we will pass in the uuid and return whatever aggregate we get or an error if there's no such product we can add products of course so um let's add a product uh, which will simply return an error we can update update the product 
This doesn't have to contain all these functions. It's basically up to what your repository needs to be doing. But all these functions make sense when we handle products. Maybe we can maybe we can delete products as well. So let's settle for these ones. Um, so we have the aggregate, we have the repository. We just need to create a structure which fulfills this pr uh, product repository. So let's go ahead and create a new folder. I'm going to call it memory again, because this is the memory repository for the product. So let's go ahead and call it memory. Let's basically this will be very similar to the customer repository since it's used to just you know store it in memory for now in a map. So we will do products, which is a map uuid.uuid, and we will store the aggregate product, and of course we want to protect from concurrent writes. So let's add a mutex. And by now you should really understand what we need to do. <laughs> we need to create a factory. So let's create a factory which creates the memory product repository. So let's return a pointer to a memory products repository. Let's initialize because that's what the factory does. It initializes. And then we also need to fulfill all the functions inside of the repository. So let's go ahead, memory product repository, which has a get all, which should return everything inside the repository as a slice. So let's do aggregate dot product and we return an error. So we will need to convert the map into a into a slice. Uh, so product range NPR. Let's range over them and let's do products append and the products and return products. In this case, we will never return an error, but it's up to the interface to determine if it's possible. It's not up to the implementation, it's up to the interface. So the repository decides if we need to return an error or not. If this was to re be replaced with a MongoDB instance, uh, we, would, we would need an error because the connection could fail or whatever. So let's go ahead and just implement a few of these functions. So we have get by ID, which is the ID, and we return an aggregate product. And inside of here, we check if the product is present inside the map. And so let's get by ID. We are passing in the ID, so let's just check if it's there. And if it isn't, we return the product. If it is here, we will return a, a one of those errors that we created, or we didn't create any errors, maybe. Product dot. Okay, so we didn't create any errors, which we need to do. I'm going to create a product not found error inside of the product repository. Let's just make it say no such product. And let's import the domain product. Let's import the error so that's or the product package so we know what uh, we can uh, return. So let's go ahead and keep continuing with these functions. We do the update updates and it's an aggregate product 
and it returns an error. So we do kind of need to NPR lock. We can defer the unlock. Um, and we can check if there is a uh, we can check if the ID using the get ID if it's not available and if it's not available we can return a product not found again for instance we could wrap this and make it more clear if it is present we will simply overwrite get the ID from the update function say that it's actually assign it to that let's assign it and let's return nil and we also one final function we need to be able to delete and let's say uuids we will delete uuids whenever they are passed in and very similar to the update function we will lock and we will defer or unlock we will check if the item isn't present if there is no such item present we can't delete it and let's go say product not found if it is we can simply call the delete on the products and the id as key and return nil so this would be a in-memory implementation of the products and now we can go ahead and return to the order service and the order service needs a products repository which we Im import oh look at that prod cut uh, let's change that to google i made a typo so let's rename that to product repository right so we have customers and we have products for this order service. Now a service can hold multiple repositories, but a service is also allowed to hold other services. So a order service could in here hold a billing, billing service, for instance. So we wouldn't have to re-implement the billing service if the order needs to uh, bill for the order. We could simply hold a sub-service inside a service. But before and not to confuse you, let's keep doing what we do. So let's add a new order configuration function. So with memory product repository this time, and it accepts a array of aggregate products and it returns a order configuration, same as before. So we begin by returning the function and the function signature is to always return the service as a pointer and an error, of course, if there's something that goes wrong. So let's create the repository so let's go ahead and import the product repository i'm going to use an alias for this name prodmem and let's change the domain from customer to product so inside here we will do create a new prodmem.new which creates a new product memory for each and every one of the input products, we will range products and we will do if error equals product repository add. Didn't we add? We didn't add an add. My bad. Let's go ahead and create an add function also. I missed that. So let's go to the memory product. And let's do function npr memory product repository. And let's add and let's accept a product as input and return an error. 
and same as update and delete we will lock and we will unlock when we're done we will check if the product is available already by getting the id from it and we'll check and let's return product and let's return error product already exists so let's go ahead and also quickly create that error and it will say there is already such a product so if we don't have that product already we will do a new product get the id as key and insert it as the value and return nil so now inside the order service we can go back and we can add the products so let's go to pr add product and if error isn't nil we will return the error otherwise we will simply keep going and then the order service dot products will be assigned to the product repository and let's return nil so whenever we create an order service we can pass in so an example would be new order service with customer repository and with memory product repository for instance which would allow us to cr create the order service depending on our needs and whatever repositories we want to use right now so inside the create order where we left off we have no product repository we said but this time we do so let's go ahead and keep going so we do have a slice of products and we do have a price so let's go ahead and loop through all the items that is being ordered which is stored in the product IDs let's fetch those IDs from the product repository and we can do get by ID and we can insert the ID so let's check if there's an error if there's no such error we will return zero and an error Too many return values we don't want to return zero we want to return the only the error of course so we are fetching the products based on their ids from the repository now we want to append those products to the products uh, products slice that we have up here which is the products that has been ordered and we also want to update the price so let's do product get price to update the total price maybe we should call it total instead so we're getting the products we're getting the total and let's just simply print uh, whatever uh, they have ordered so customer bam has ordered products and let's get the customer id and length of the products he ordered maybe so we are getting the order we're using the customer repository to find the customer we're using the products repository to find the products and to test this let's go ahead and make a unit test which creates the order service and uh, executes um, the create order function so I'm gonna go ahead here and do order underscore test We're going to be inside the package let's first create a simple function called init products and let's do 
testing and it will return a slice of products. This is used to simply initialize tests easier. So let's go ahead and do, we want a product which is a beer. We want our tavern to serve beer. So beer and the description is a healthy beverage and the price is $1.99. So let's check if there's any errors and let's just simply fatal um, right right we can't return that of course let's simply call um, the testing fail if we fail to add because we don't want to continue our tests if um, something goes wrong in the initial initialization of the test and maybe for the beer we want some snacks and they are 099 and if the error isn't nil, let's go ahead and fail again. So we have peanuts, we have beer, and maybe we should have some wine. And aggregate, new product, wine, and it's a nasty drink. I don't like wine. So if the error isn't nil, again, let's execute a fail to stop all the tests. Um, and let's return a aggregate.product and inside we will have beer, peanuts and wine. And we need to finish with that. So init products will create a simple array with a few products for us. Now let's go ahead and create the order service test. So test order, new order service. And inside here we want the products. So let's call the init products and passing test so it can fail. Now we want to create the order service and we have the function for it, the factory function, which is new order service. New order service accepts the variable amount of configurations. But we do know we need at least a memory customer repository. We need a memory product repository and the memory product repository accepts the products as input. So let's pass that in. Let's see if there's any errors. And let's again, let's do a fail. Uh, this is not the best unit tests. I hope you see now here how cool the configuration pattern is where you can simply pass in functions that modifies the behavior of your service. Using these repositories kind of makes it really, really, really easy in the future to change the whole behavior of the service, which is really nice when you're refactoring or changing um, any vital parts or infrastructure parts, it's really handy. So let's go ahead and do a new customer. And I'm going to call him Percy. And let's do T error and Let's add the customer to the customer repository. Uh, uh, right now I'm creating the customers using uh, this, but we need to add them to the repository so that the repository knows about them. So let's go ahead and do that. The repository resides inside the service. So let's go to the order service dot customers and let's add him. Let's again check if there's any errors. So once here, let's go ahead and do a order. We need to create a order and for that we need a slice of UUIDs. So I'm just gonna go ahead and order a beer, which is the first index in my case. And let's go ahead and do order, order service dot create order. I'm gonna pass in my customer ID. I'm gonna pass in the order that I have. 
And let's check if something went wrong. And let's do that. Let's see what he complains about. Cannot assign one. All right, my bad. So let's see. The create order uh, is executed, and let's let's try it out. And we're running the test, and everything is okay. So we can even do a. Let's go ahead and do a. Let's do a debug, so we can see the output out also. And whenever we do the debug, we get the output. So we can see here, customer blah 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 has ordered one product, which is really cool. Um, so I hope I haven't confused you too much yet. Entities and value objects, they are instances and entities are changeable, mutable, and value objects are not. Aggregates hold multiple entities or value objects, but they are related to one root entity. You have the repository which manages the aggregates and you have services which combines and ties together the repositories. So it's time to test the final thing, the final piece of this puzzle. We need to create a tavern and the tavern is a service. So basically inside the services, I'm going to go ahead and create a file called tavern because that's what we're set out to build from the beginning. In this file, we will be a service and we will create the tavern structure. And the tavern structure will hold the order service because we want to take orders inside our tavern. So order service and it will hold a pointer to a order service. So this is the tavern will be a service and it will hold subservices. As explained before, we can do this. And in here, we also want to maybe have a billing service so we can accept payments uh, or whatever, how we want to uh, structure that is basically up to you and your application. Um, Basically, let's just add a billing service and let's make it an interface for now. Um, just to make this really simple. And again, I will use the same pattern as before. I will create a tavern configuration, which is a function signature, which accepts a pointer to a tavern so we can modify it and returns an error. Now, the factory will be new tavern we will accept a variable amount of tavern configurations and we will return the finished version of the tavern configured and done and an error if something goes wrong. So let's go ahead and create the tavern or a pointer instance for of it and let's range through all the configurations and let's apply them config input our tavern and if error isn't nil return error and nil so we accept a variable amount of configurations we loop through them we apply them to our instance and if nothing goes wrong we return the configured instance so again the tavern service will have a with order service function which accept a fully configured order service so we return a order tavern configuration so return the function which is the signature which would be a tavern and in here we apply order service to be the order service that we pass in and we turn nil if nothing goes wrong Let's also create a simple function. We have the tavern, we do order, customer, 
UUID. Remember, we need a UUID and we need products to make an order. UUID and we do error. So at this point of time, it doesn't make much sense. But let's go inside the order service again and make a small adjustment. I do know why I wanted the order service to return two values. Let's go ahead and not accept the output value and it will complain. And let's go inside the order here and let's return a float 64. So let's return the total from the order uh, whenever somebody orders something. So let's go ahead and in here we return total. So let me close this. We don't need this open right now. So whenever somebody orders, we calculate the total price and we return that from the order service. And inside the tavern, we do get the price. So let's go ahead, go to the order service. We create the order. We pass in the customer ID. We pass in the products that they want to order. We check if there's any errors. Return error. And bill the customer. Let's see what we should bill the customer whenever our service runs. Return nil. Let's see what it says. We do print f instead. We can pass a new line in the beginning. We can pass a new line in the end just to make it a bit clear. So our order service accepts orders using the or our, our tavern accepts orders using the order service. But we can then continue working on the order, for instance, billing the customer. And chaining, chaining these things makes it very flexible. Again, I'm gonna go ahead and make a test file to test this out. Uh, package services. I'm gonna do test the tavern, make some final testing here. So again, we're gonna init the products because we need products like that. And let's create our order service using the order service factory. So we need the customer repository and we need the memory product repository, which accepts the products. And let's see, it should be a memory customer repository instead. So we are creating the order service. Let's just fail if something goes wrong. Now that we have the order service, which we will use as a sub service to the tavern, let's initialize the tavern. So new tavern with order service and pass in the order service. Again, we can check if anything goes wrong. And now, we can now we have a tavern so we need to generate a customer so we can test this so let's go ahead and create a new customer and if anything is wrong again let's just fail and let's make a little order this is not how i would make a real application make orders passing a list of uh, but you get the idea so now we have the tavern, we have the customer, we have the order. Let's let's try it. Let's do tavern order and let's get the ID and let's pass in the order. And if the error isn't nil, let's go ahead and do a fatal. And let's see, no new variables, of course, sorry. So let's go ahead and debug this and we should see that the customer was not found in the repository, uh, of course, because we are only creating the customer here. We need to go ahead and do uh, if error uh, order service customers add, let's add the customer to the repository. And if there's any error, let's simply do a fatal. Let's debug again. And now you can see we're using the order service to make an order and then we're getting the price back and we're simply the tavern is simply logging that value right now. 
but you could pass the value into the next service or another repository and basically how you want to do that. Now, at, at this point of time, we are only using in-memory repositories. But hopefully you get the idea that we can easily replace these repositories with another implementation. If I were to create a MongoDB implementation of this instead, I would simply be able to go inside the, uh, the factory function here, for instance. So if we want to use the MongoDB repository instead, I would do with Mongo customer repository, for instance. And But if we implement that function, we can simply replace the factory func uh, function call with the repository and everything will continue to work. The, that unit test will continue to work even though we replace the in-memory solution with the MongoDB solution. This is really great. We haven't talked about how you would structure your data yet because I said before that we don't structure the data uh, in here. You would do that inside of the repository. So basically, if we have a memory repository, for instance, we determine how to store the customers in that repository. And if you have a MongoDB instead, you would determine how to store the customers inside the MongoDB, which format to use, what the column or fields would be in MySQL. That's up to the repository and that should never uh, be spilled out or affect any other service. Uh, they should always confirm to the aggregate model that we have in the code, but then it can change depending on the database, of course. But then it's up to the um, implementation of the repository to confirm and convert back between the format whenever it stores it and when it passes the customer out, it should convert it back. So now that we have the whole tavern in place, I think it's actually time to implement a Mongo repository to show you how easily it is to switch a repository and have the service still functioning correctly. So inside the customer domain, I'm just gonna go ahead and create a new folder called Mongo. And Mongo will have a Mongo file, which package Mongo. So I'm going to go ahead and create Mongo repository struct. And we will contain a MongoDB database. Let's see, Mongo database. Let's import that, the Mongo driver. Let's go ahead and do go mod tidy to fetch that. I often do go mod tidy instead of go get, seems simpler to me. So uh, we will have a collection for storing customers. So I'm gonna go ahead and add that. Now let's make a super simple uh, customer struct inside the Mongo. Remember, the Mongo customer is an internal type that is used to store a customer aggregate inside this repository. We have to use an internal struct to avoid coupling. So this implementation shouldn't have any coupling to the aggregate. So that's the reason why we have a totally separate, um, totally separate structure inside the repository package. So I'm gonna go ahead and make sure we are maintaining a UUID because that's something that we need to maintain. And we are going to store the name in this case. We're using the Bison tags because it's MongoDB. So one very common approach is to have some sort of converters between the formats. So since we're not 
operating on aggregates straight away inside this we can sort of have these helper functions that convert between the formats for us. So I'm gonna just go ahead and have new from customer which is a function that accepts the aggregate.customer and returns a Mongo customer. So we're going to create the customer and assign the correct values using the get ID and using the get name like that. So now we can easily go from an aggregate to a local internal um, struct which we will use. And then of course we will do the other way around. So one converter and this is this is probably the, the thing that I like least about this approach because it's a little bit overhead when you switch between the formats. But again, it's really easy to implement. It doesn't take a long time to have these formatters. Um, and you get kind of much from it having this loose coupling. It's really nice when you're doing a refactor. So let's go ahead and create a new aggregate. And let's do set instead of get this time. And we have the ID in that field and set name is present there. And let's return the customer created. So those two functions will handle that for us. Of course, if you have larger structs, they become larger, but should be fairly simple to implement. So what we need is a get add and update function. And now to save some time, I'm not gonna implement the update stuff. Uh, I'm just gonna have the functions to comply with the interface. So let's go ahead and the new will create a new repository. We will accept a connection string because that's how you connect using Mongo. And in here we will create a new client mongo.connect context let's add some options options let's do apply yuri and then the connection string and let's check if there's any errors again let's return those errors so once we are connected we can fetch the database yeah, let's call it ddd for this purpose and let's go ahead and have a collection called customers and then let's return that repository and we're going to save the database and we're going to save a pointer to the customers collection so we can easily switch and let's see mix name oh my bad connection string we need to make that a string of course and so we have the connect function in place so let's go ahead and create a simple let's see, Mongo repository. We have a get function. And again, we accept the UUID. We turn an aggregate, aggregate.customer, and an error. And here we will then query the database for the value that we're searching for. Context background, 10 times a second. Defer cancel. So let's see, let's do, let's go to the collection. Let's do find one. Let's pass in the context and a B some M. And what we're doing here is that we're searching for this particular ID. Uh, and let's import, let's marshal the result into a customer because that's the format that we will be storing the values in. So let's decode and then again value checks and I'm going to return an empty aggregate and error. And here we're going to call the helper function to aggregate and nil. So the let's see it's, or what does it complain about? 
It's only used. Okay, sorry, it's my linter. If error, we can do this instead. And this is shorthand syntax in Go for if error. So we find the customer, we decode it, and we return it as an aggregate. Otherwise, we return an error. And we also need to be able to add to the database. So let's go ahead and do Mongo aggregate add, and we return an error if anything is wrong. And I messed up. I have the camera blocking part of my screen, which is <laughs> not good. Sorry about that. So let's see. Again, let's create a context, and it's going to be with a timeout. And we're going to set that context to 10 times seconds. And we're going to defer cancel. And then we're going to create a internal format. So we, we, we accept the aggregate, we convert it to the internal format. And then we will go ahead and insert that into the collection. So we can return error, otherwise we can return nil. So for the update part, I'm just going to go ahead and do a panic because we're not going to use it. So let me just go ahead and do to implement. And now we have the Mongo repository in place. We can backtrack and go into the order service. And the order service, we will create a new function, which is similar to with memory customer repository, but instead it will be with Mongo customer repository. And again, it will return an order configuration, but Let's go ahead and initialize, instead of memory, we're going to do Mongo. And we're going to accept a context. So let's go ahead and do context.context .context and also a connection string. And we're going to pass those inside mongo.new which will return an error if something is wrong. So we need to actually be able to return the error. So I'm gonna go ahead and do it like this instead. So we're returning the function. So if this error is not nil, we will return that error. And we can go ahead and do return nil. We don't need to use that wrapper function. Let's go do order service customers equals the customer repository return nil. So now we have a function that helps us configure Mongo instead of a in-memory repository. So remember the unit test for the tavern. We have it here. We initialize a product and we sort of add everything to the repository. And this works when it's in memory. However, if we change this now to instead run with the Mongo customer repository, which will accept the context and a connection string, so let's go ahead and add a connection string to my local host 2707 and comma. So if we add the connection string, this will work. If we have a Mongo up and running, this will now work as well as it did with the memory repository. It will be the same thing for the service. The service won't have to care about what repository it is. We have configured the repository. It will trust that it fulfills the interface. Otherwise, the 
compiler will complain. And if we were to execute this now, uh, we will get the same result as we did with the in-memory repository, which is pretty nice. We replaced the whole customer repository with one line of code, or we have to create the repository of, repository, of course, but we can replace parts really easy. And it's just really, really, really amazing. So in this article, we have covered the basics of domain-driven design. In short, we have covered entities, which are mutable, identifiable structures. We have covered value objects, which are immutable, unidentifiable structures, such as transactions without an ID. We have covered aggregates, which is a combination of entities and value objects stored in a repository. Repositories are a implementation for storing aggregates and other information. We have covered factories, which is used to create and help create complex objects by creating a new instance easier for the developer and other domains. So new memory repository, for instance. We have covered services, which is a collection of repositories or subservices that builds together the business flow. Remember, in this example, we have named everything after what it is. So we have a aggregate and we have a customer domain and we have a product domain, we have entities folder which contains our entities and this is not how I would do it in a real project. If you want to, this video is more about learning what all the concepts are. If you want to see how to structure a domain driven uh, project instead, I can recommend you my other video about that, how to structure domain driven design in Go, which is a lot shorter, I promise. <laughs> Uh, there's a lot less to cover in that one. So I will leave you up to implement a one great exercise for you could be implement a billing service. But I do recommend you to train a little bit with it. And I hope it I hope this makes sense. I know it's a lot to take in and I really hope I narrowed it down for you. You can find the full code for this project inside GitHub where you can check out how I did things. And hopefully you like this video. So feel free to reach out to me uh, in any possible way. Like and subscribe this video if you liked it, of course. Um, and I love feedback. So if you have any feedback, feel free to reach out. Thank you.